You know, I, I, it's kind of funny. I, I thought it was kind of funny. The, 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 these songs where they can split it. Did you notice that they gave the women the hard part? And they gave the guys a holy, 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 right? Of course. <laughs> Why is that? I don't know. I'm not, I'm not going to go there. Yeah. <laughs> well, good morning and welcome. And I, let me say welcome to all that are going to be joining us online. This morning we're going to pick up where we left off last week. We're still in this where this time where Jesus has made the statement, I am the light of the world. And so uh, we're, we're going to pick up uh, on that ongoing study in the Gospel of John. So if you have your Bibles, turn with, you, turn with me, if you will, to John chapter 8. And this morning we're going to pick up where we left off last week in verse 21. But before we get reading this passage, what do we do? Prayer. Prayer. Yes, pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this day, and we thank you for all who are here. We thank you for all who will be joining us online, and Lord, again, we pray this for the safety of all those that are traveling and that are, are um, and that may be at home that's homesick. And Lord, I just pray that you would, you would just deal with each one. And, and so, Lord, um, I, I just pray that you would just be with me this morning, that you would help me with uh, with this message that, that Lord it be your words and not mine and that uh, we would really get what Jesus is trying to tell these people uh, and so Lord none of us wants to die in our sins so uh, this is this is a this is a stark message that, that Jesus has given so uh, we we want we want to we want to uh, not do that so that we can we can have eternal life in you so Lord we thank you praise you for what you're going to do and we pray this in Jesus name amen okay so John has made it very clear that that the, rege- the, the re- their rejection of Jesus uh, has been uh, has been pretty evident and, and so we're coming to that section in John's Gospel. And you'll recall that eight chapters now, John the Apostle, who's writing this Gospel under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> for eight chapters now, John has, has been clearly recounting the claims that Christ has made. And he's made lots of claims. Uh, he's been carefully outlining each claim as the event has transpired. Remember, as his pattern, he gives, he gives an event or a... Or a uh, time where there's uh, interaction and and then he he Jesus makes his claims uh, and so he's shown us where Jesus has given the people of, of Israel sufficient evidence to prove without a doubt who he is but we've also seen that John is making it extremely clear to us that the rejection is evident you know it's very evident it's, it's inexcusable and it really makes them um, guilty of unbelief by the statements that they make and the things that they do. And that's exactly what has happened. Christ's claims have been so clear. I mean, you've seen it. They've been extremely clear and and they've been sufficient to produce faith in the people. And the people have not believed and they have only themselves to blame. You know, and we we sometimes say that. Well, you only have yourself to blame if you don't believe, right? It's true. You know, now, Anyone who has seen, heard, or experienced everything Jesus has done and still doesn't believe, in the eyes of Jesus, he is entirely responsible for their unbelief. I mean, they have to be responsible for your own belief or unbelief. For the revelation of God has been complete. It's complete. It it has been substantial. I mean, just in eight chapters alone, we've seen it, right? And it's been sufficient to make unbelief actually inexcusable. Anyone who can get to the 8th chapter of John without seeing who Jesus is really has no excuse. I mean, and, and any Jew that was living in Jerusalem during those days, and anyone else that was living in Galilee in those days, uh, who could have heard and seen all that they heard and saw, and still conclude that, that this was not the Christ, that Jesus was not the Christ, has nobody to blame but themselves. Uh, because all the evidence has been presented to them and all the evidence is there. Amen? Amen. But tragically, that's exactly what took place. And in John 3, we learned why. Why did John 3, in John 3, John tells us why. 
It says, and this is the judgment, the light is coming in the world, meaning Jesus, right? And the people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Historically, people have loved the darkness more than the light. Amen? Amen. Do you see that more and more every day? Amen. I do. And why? It's because their actions are evil. They willfully rejected Jesus Christ and his claims. And we've seen that over and over and over again, where the people have made a conscious choice to reject Jesus and the claims that he makes. Now, you'll remember, for example, in Galilee, when Jesus went up to Galilee and made all those claims in Galilee, and he taught them and he healed them and he fed them. Remember the feeding of the 5,000? And as long as he was doing that, everything was wonderful. He was extremely popular, <clears throat> and they wanted to make him their king. But that was only as long as he was healing their sick and meeting their physical needs. As soon as he started talking about spiritual blessings and what, it, what, what was required of each person to receive those blessings, when they were only interested in physical blessings from Jesus, he, the, the physical things that he could give them, he no longer fit into their messianic mold. And we've seen that, that come to pass, right? When he started demanding spiritual cleansing and started speaking about spiritual realities, uh, he left them. He eventually left them, but they left him. Then you'll remember that he came to Jerusalem, and when in Jerusalem was much different, right? He left Galilee, came to Jerusalem. The opinion of Jesus followed a, a similar course that he had in, in, in Galilee. Jesus once again proved without a shadow of a doubt who he was through his deeds and his actions, his words, and the ability to, his, his ability to impact people's lives was completely evident. He was passionate. He was amazing to hear. And enormous crowds followed him, and they, and they moved with him everywhere he went. He healed them, and he took care of their physical needs. But then he began to measure the genuineness of their following. Did they really believe? Did they really believe? And remember, he started to sift the crowd, separating the genuine followers from the counterfeit believers, based, based on the spiritual demands that he was making. And he began to talk about sin. He talked about hypocrisy. He talked about spiritual realities, and the crowd became divided. You'll remember that when we came to the last sections that we were talking about, the last couple of chapters, John tells us that there was a division among the people over Jesus. And, and by the end of chapter 6, we saw that the, the crowd began to walk away from Jesus. Remember? He turned to his own disciples, and he says, Are you going to leave me too? Right? Their hypocrisy and false religion became the issue for them. To them, Jesus was no longer messianic material. This is not the guy that we want as our Messiah. They didn't get his message anymore, and they didn't like his message, and the crowds began to melt away. And chapter 6 is where that, we start to see that really fall apart in the Bread of Life discourse. Therefore, the truth uh, of the first chapter really came to pass. You know, in the first chapter, it says, He came to his own, and what happened? His own did not receive him. And we've seen that. We're watching it, and it's, it's unfolding right before our eyes. But, but they were responsible because they heard the truth. They had a responsibility because they, they knew the truth. The offer of salvation was clear, and they made their choice. Now, we know that many did believe, uh, but, but it, wasn't, it wasn't a ton of people. It was only a small percentage, like it is today. Remember back in chapter 7? When there was a division among the people over him, in verse 40, he says, When they heard these words, some of the people said, Well, this is really the prophet. And others said, This is the Christ. But then it goes on to say that most of them walked away. That most of them rejected him. And they had no one to blame. Again, if they reject him, no one to blame but themselves. So we've seen that progression in chapter 7 and 8. And beginning in chapter 7, it was kind of a confused hope, hope, hopefulness. You know, it's people like scratching their head going, you know, maybe, maybe this, this person is the Messiah. Perhaps, maybe, kind of. There's kind of a confused hopefulness. However, by the end of this 8th chapter, and you're going to see this, uh, we're going to see that they, they react to him in such violent hostility that they pick up rocks and they want to stone him. That's how bad it gets. And so Jerusalem, just like Galilee, rejected Jesus 
and all of his claims and, and, uh, and with all the magnificence of his person. I mean, you think about that. With all the miracles that he did and, and witnessing it all, they rejected him. You know, they rejected him. And that rejection led to the statement in verse 21 where we're going to begin our message today. Look at what it says in verse 21. <clears throat> so he said to them, I am going away and you will seek me and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. Those are pretty stern words, right? Now listen, it's kind of like in essence Jesus is saying, because you rejected me, you're going to die in your sins and you're going to wake up too late to the fact that you missed out on believing in the Messiah. I am the Messiah. You, he, he's saying your rejection is resulting in a sentence. Uh, the, the tragic result of refusing Jesus Christ is to die in your sin. It, that's a tragic result then. That's a tragic result today. It, you know, it is a, it is a tragedy um, and that people would die in their sin, to die in a state where they're unforgiven and they're doomed and, and they're eternally damned, unfit for heaven, never to enter it. Jesus said to them, that's your situation. You're going to die in your sin. And he's talking about eternal death, eternal separation from God. <clears throat> and that's still going on today. Did you know I was looking, I, was, I went to a new, numerous sites to find out how many people die in a minute now. I mean, we got almost 8 billion people on this planet, you know, and, and now that we have 8 billion people, uh, most sites said that, it was, generally speaking, it's about 100, 120 a minute uh, people are dying, uh, about 120. Out of that, you know, we have about 105 that are going to hell, according to statistics. 105 a minute a minute so you take you take the 40 minutes that I'm going to be preaching today and you multiply that out that's a I mean you could you could fill a pretty good building with with the, the amount of people that are pouring into hell because of unbelief right uh, and that is the ultimate tragedy amen every horrible thing beyond our imagination is is a part of that hell weeping wailing gnashing of teeth fire and unquenchable thirst uh, punishment, separation from God, and yet people go there for the simple reason that they reject Jesus Christ. And, and, and for all these chapters prior to this, Christ has been making his claims. He's been telling them, I am the Savior, I am your Messiah. He keeps telling them, I am from God, I am God, here on earth. But, but now we see the shift, and we're going to stop seeing him make these claims. He's not going to make these claims right now. He's going to start making condemnations. Before this, every you know, he was saying, I'm the light of the world. And he was calling people to himself. We just, we just read that last week. I am the light of the world. Now he says, you're going to seek me and you're, you're not going to find me. And you are going to die in your sin. Amen. That's what he's saying. Uh, and because of their rejection and unbelief, Jesus warns them and says, uh, the inevitable consequence... To your unbelief is you're going to die in your sin. So I have people that ask me all the time, and I mean, I'm 25 years in ministry. I'm telling you, I've heard this over and over again. Uh, people say, how can a good God send people to hell? Well, that answer is so simple. It is so simple. It's, it's this. He doesn't. He doesn't send anyone to hell. We do it to ourselves. People choose that. People do that. Jesus said in John 5, 40, you search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life. And remember, he was talking to the Pharisees and scribes. And it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you might have what? Life. Life. You refuse to come, Jesus says. You reject me. And it's a natural, inevitable consequence. You will die in your sins. The inevitable consequence of rejection of Jesus Christ is that, that a man or a woman, if that's the case, will die in their sins. That's the moral order on which this universe is built. It is built on that. Tragically, many choose to die in their sins, and many do. 
And so this morning, let's look at why people choose to die in their sins. What causes them? What are the characteristics that cause someone to die in their sins? What are the characteristics? Uh, what would those characteristics be that, for, that when Jesus is talking to these Jewish leaders in this passage, what would make them die in their sins? And from that, I think we can get a pretty clear picture from this passage uh, how people actually do die in their sin. Uh, what do you have to do or not do to die in your sins? Okay, you don't want to know. I mean, you want to know what it takes not to die in your sins, right? Well, from this passage, we can come up with four characteristics. Um, characteristics of a person uh, who who first... These, that, that character that characterizes what a what a person who is going to die in their sin. This is this is their attitude. This is this is what happens. Okay, so first there's a self righteous attitude. That's a that's that's one that's one that'll be. I guarantee you that'll get you there. Secondly, embracing the world system. Thirdly, it's remaining in your unbelief. And fourthly, it's choosing to be willful willfully ignorant. It's like I choose not to know. Right. <clears throat> Any combination of those or any single one, self-righteousness, worldliness, unbelieving, or choosing to be willfully ignorant, Jesus says those are four ways that you're going to die in your sins. We're going to look at, it, at the first two this week and we're going to the, the next two next week. Jesus said you'll die in your sin. Where I'm going, you cannot come. And then they proceeded as they interacted with Jesus to confirm exactly what Christ said by showing that they had all four of these things active in their life. They were self-righteous, they were worldly, they were unbelieving, and they were willfully, by choice, ignorant. And so Jesus could say to them, you're going to die in your sins, because they met every single requirement for someone to die in their sins. They met every requirement. So let's look at the first one. <clears throat> The first one, if you're filling in the blank, is having a self-righteous attitude. A lot of you are type A like me. Boy, you better have those blanks filled in, huh? <laughs> if not, I'm usually running up and I'm saying, I need to know number two. Yeah, it's got to be filled in. First, they were self-righteous. The, the, the first way, you, if you want to die in your sins, is to have a self-righteous attitude. That was the first characteristic. Uh, having no need of Christ. I don't need Christ. Being completely content with yourself, just as you are. That's what self-righteousness is. It's putting your faith in your own goodness. It's putting your faith in yourself. And these people are perfect examples of this. Their self-righteous attitude is perfectly illustrated here in this passage. And I want you to see it. Look at verse 22. <clears throat> so the Jews said... Now you'll remember that we said that any time that John talks as the Jews... You know, that, you know what he's talking about. He's talking about the Jewish leadership. He's talking about the Pharisees and the scribes. He's not, just, he's not necessarily talking about the people as a whole, the Jewish people as a whole. He's talking about, the, he's referring to Jewish leaders, not so much the people, people, but the leaders. So the Jews said, and so that means the scribes and the Pharisees, meaning, uh, so, so they said, will he kill himself since he says, where I am going, you cannot come you got to scratch your head saying, what in the world would make them say something like that? Just as a surface reading, don't you think? Why would he say he's going to kill himself? Um, so what did they mean by this? Well, uh, Jesus said he'd leave, and, and they wouldn't be able to find him. So that's part of it, right? And he informed them that. He says, I'm going to the Father, and then, and then you will die aimlessly searching for a Messiah, uh, that you've already misunderstood and rejected. You're going to die unfulfilled, unredeemed, unforgiven, and unreconciled to God. And the eternal home of your of the Father is going to be closed to you forever. Now what Jesus is doing here is he's announcing their coming demise. He's, he's announcing their doom. He's saying to them, in fact, because of your ongoing rejection of my person, of who I am, my works, my words, that all spells your doom. Now, the seriousness of this rejection is without words to describe. There's no words to describe rejecting Jesus Christ on any of these levels. To reject Jesus Christ is serious. 
and to reject him based on your own self-righteousness is nothing but foolishness. Foolishness. And this is clearly demonstrated by these men. And I want you to see, see, see it in a statement in verse 22. Will he not kill himself since he says, where I'm going, you cannot come? Now, why would he say that? Why would they say that? Now, what did they actually mean by that? Just this. You see, when they asked this question, I want you to know what was happening behind the scenes. They're actually making fun of Jesus. They're ridiculing him. They're mocking him. Their hostility for Jesus and their rejection of Jesus was so extreme that he appeared to them as a joke. They thought he was a complete joke. You say, how can, you, how can that question be mocking Jesus? Hang on with me and I'm going to show you. I'm going to give you a little bit of background here so that you can understand this. You see, for 2,000 years ago, in Jewish thinking, if a person killed themselves, or if they committed suicide, they had reserved for them the darkest place in hell. And Josephus, in his history, records that it was, common, it was a common Jewish opinion that anybody who committed suicide was cast in the darkest part of Hades and was separated from Abraham's bosom, which was what, where the Jews... That, that place where the Jews called uh, a place for the good dead. It would have been, would have been known as paradise, uh, but they were excluded from that. So you'll remember the rich man that was in hell and Lazarus that was in Abraham's bosom. Abraham's bosom. But, but Hades was the blackest and the darkest part of, of that, of that uh, location. So anyone who died committing suicide, they believe, uh, would go to Hades permanently. So you see, an Orthodox Jew, to an Orthodox Jew, suicide was a big thing. It was a huge thing. It was a very significant thing because the rabbis had always taught anyone who commits, committed suicide went to that darkest place uh, permanently. But listen to me, and I want you to hear me well on this, okay? No matter what the rabbis believed back then, the Bible doesn't teach that if you're a Christian and you commit suicide, that that, that fate is yours. When, you know, listen, you, you know, suicide is a sin. Amen? Amen. Okay? It, cause, because it's not allowing God to direct your life. Because God would not, never direct you to do that. But if a Christian commits suicide, that Christian is going to be with Jesus. He's going to be with Jesus. Sure, he's going to lose some rewards, but he is... He's, he's going to be with Jesus. And you need to understand that suicide is a sin, like murder is a sin, like stealing is a sin, like adultery is a sin, uh, lying is a sin. Did Jesus die for those sins? Yes, he did. Is there any sin that he cannot forgive? You say, I say no, but, but there is one. There's one. Only one. The unpardonable sin is dying in your sins without Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, without receiving the salvation that he so freely offers. Okay, so now we know what they're saying. They're ridiculing him. They're saying perhaps he's going to kill himself, and then he's going to go to the darkest place of Hades and escape us there. You see where their logic is coming from? Because they're far too righteous to ever go there. Those scribes and Pharisees, they were way too righteous to go there. Do you, do you get that picture? Yeah. They're self-righteous. They're ridiculing God himself. How horrible is that? How terrible is that? They're so arrogant and they're so self-righteous. And by that statement, they implied that they were going to heaven. That they're going to heaven. And Jesus, he's going to the darkest place in hell. But it was just the opposite. Their statement clearly revealed their self-righteousness. And worse yet, it was a self-assured self-righteousness. You ever tell yourself, I'm good enough? Boy, that's a, that's a lie straight out of hell. Because you're not good enough. I'm not good enough. Nobody's good enough. Only Jesus is good, right? And worse yet, and so that self-assured. Solomon said in Proverbs 30, 12, that there are those who are pure in their own eyes and yet are not cleansed of their filth. So we look in the mirror and we go, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, you ever do that? We're very lenient on ourselves. You see, they were so righteous in their own eyes that Jesus was a joke to them. They thought what he was saying was a joke, but they were deaf to what he said. 
What had he said? He had just said you're going to die in your sins, but they were preoccupied with defaming him and mocking him and making fun of Jesus, and they never heard a word that he said. And that's how unbelief operates. Amen? You ever talk to somebody about Jesus and you just hit a blank wall? I mean, it's just a blank stare. Uh, Unbelief never hears anything. So once more, they directed their hatred toward the glorious Son of God. Now, he would die. Yes, we know that. And and they were correct that he would die. About six months later, he was going to die on the cross for for the world, for the sin of the world. Uh, and, and, And they would actually be part of it. They would be part of it. Uh, He would die voluntarily, yes, but it sure wasn't suicide. No, he would die by the hands of men. And that's only because he allowed men to do that. And it's true that he would go somewhere where they can't come, because he said that. Uh, But it wasn't Hades, it was heaven. Because with their attitude and their their belief system, if, if, if they thought they were going to heaven, they had another thing coming. And they didn't get that. He said, I'm going where you can't go. And they naturally assumed he's going, he's going to the darkest part there. But it was heaven that he was talking about where they would never go. He was going to die and they didn't understand. So their ignorant, self-righteous mocking makes the message of Jesus just look like a joke. It makes it just look like a joke. So, you know, you see how sometimes reading over the scripture, you can just skip right over that? It would be very easy to do that, right? Uh, So listen, Jesus isn't a joke. When Jesus says you're going to die in your sins, that's no laughing matter. They were so self-righteous that they made a mockery of Jesus. How how self-righteous would you have to be to do that? You know, when you think about it, that's pretty self-righteous. Listen. Self-righteousness is, a, is deadly because it's a guarantee that you will die in your sins. You'll never be good enough. I can never be good enough. I can never do enough. In Matthew 7, 21, Christ gives us a picture of his coming judgment to those who are self-righteous. He says, not everyone, scariest verse in the Bible, by the way, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. He says, I never knew you. I never had that intimate love relationship that I wanted to have with you. Because you were stubborn and too self-righteous. Two chapters later in Matthew 9, Jesus got pretty sarcastic with the Jews. And look what he said in verse 10. As Jesus reclined at the table, you'll remember the story, uh, in the house, is Matthew, the Matthew party, right? Uh, As Jesus reclined at the table in the house, uh, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And, the, and in the eyes of everyone, if you sat down you had dinner with the, with the tax collector, ah, oh, that's bad news. That's bad news. This is, this is, it's like inviting somebody from the IRS to come and have dinner. You know, it's a good thing, I suppose. Yeah. Nobody works for the IRS, right? Okay. They were the lowest of the low in the eyes of the, uh, the Jewish people. They, they were the worst of the worst and openly admitted to being sinners. They did. These people, they just openly admitted to being sinners. And yet, they hung out with Jesus and his disciples. And look at what happened. When the Pharisees, who, supposedly had, uh, who were supposedly known for their piety, you know, extreme piety, when they arrived there, uh, it says, and when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? In other words, what's Jesus doing hanging around with this bunch? This is a rowdy, nasty bunch. But when he heard it, meaning Jesus, when Jesus heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, those who are sick. Can you, can you just hear the sarcasm in that statement? 
He's implying that they're well, and at least they think they're well. They think they're the, they're the people that are well. So it's like Jesus is saying, and what am I going to do with you? You're already well. I don't spend time with people that are, that are well. Uh, verse 13, or at least you think you're well. Go and learn what it means. I desire, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. In other words, I'm sick of your works. I'm sick of your sacrifices. I'm sick of all the things that you do. For I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners. To repentance. If you're convinced that you are self-righteous, God can't do anything with you. He can't nudge you. He will not make you put your faith and trust in Him. He won't. If you think you're good enough, He'll let you think you're good enough because He loves you that much. If a man doesn't recognize his sin and his need for forgiveness, and his need for forgiveness, I guarantee you he is trusting in one person and one person only, and that's himself. And it's not Christ. Even Isaiah says, but we, we're all like an unclean thing, and all of our righteousness are like filthy rags. Paul said in Romans 3.20, For by works of the law no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. That's where, the, that's where we learn about, about how we fall short. You can't, you can't be, be redeemed by the law. You can't be redeemed by works of the law or by works. In the next verse, verses 21 to 23, Paul goes on to say it's only by the righteousness of Christ that's given to us that we can be righteous. Because it's not my righteousness. And your righteousness is not your righteousness. It's Christ's righteousness that's been given to me and to you. So it's very simple. The first reason that people die in their sins is because they're self-righteous. They never recognize their sin. <clears throat> they never acknowledge that they're separated from God. They don't even admit that they've ever done anything wrong. They put all their trust in themselves. They, they have confidence in their good works on their being religious, quote-unquote. Uh, their godly thoughts from time to time. Oh, I think about God, you know. But they don't ever face their sin, and they maintain their self-righteousness. You know something? They're going to stock those up. They're going to pile those good works up. They're going to keep piling them up. They're going to keep piling them up. And rather than God crediting those good works to them, He is going to use those good works to damn them. Because that's not good enough. It isn't. You can lay it all on his feet. There's nothing you can do that's good enough. So G Jesus meets them again on the level of their self-righteousness. But then Jesus, with a skill that cannot be matched, I just love this, he uses the sharp edge of his wisdom and he cuts right to the heart of their problem. Verse 23, Jesus uses some pretty devastating words. He said to them, You are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. Now those, if you took them seriously, would be frightening words. Amen? Amen. You, know, you know what he's saying? He's saying because, because there's irony in this statement. They've just said, well, you're going to go somewhere we can't come. Right? And they're, they're alluding that it's Hades. Well, well, maybe you're going to kill yourself and go to that darkest place in Hades uh, and there's no way that we'd ever go down there uh, to the darkest place of Hades. And Jesus says, no, you're, you came from there. That's what he's saying. He's saying, you came from there. Do you see that? Like, like he's saying, don't tell me that you're, you're not going there. That's where you came from. Now, we know they didn't actually physically come from there. Uh, they didn't come from there. But, but you can be guaranteed that the source of their unbelief and the source of their hatred and hypocrisy and the source of their self-righteousness definitely came from the pits of hell. Jesus speaks beyond the person sometimes. Have you noticed that? He speaks beyond the person. Remember what he said to Peter? He said, get, me, get, get thee behind me, what? Satan. Well, was, Peter wasn't Satan, but he was saying Satan was behind what Peter was saying. So that's what he's saying. He's saying, you think, you think that you're not going to the darkest part of Hades? Your whole operation comes from there. 
Your whole practice comes from there. All their unbelief, all their hypocrisy, all their false religion came right out of the pit itself. Willful, ignorant unbelief right out of Satan's own backyard. Look at verse 44. You, I'm, I'm, I'm really kicking it up because I want, you, I want you to see what he's going to say a little later. And we're going to go over that when we get to it. But he says, you are of your father the devil and your will is to do your father's desire. You see what he's coming from? That's just the means. That just means the, the source of their activity is, from, is hell itself. That's the source of their activity. Satan's activity in their life. Their spiritual father is the devil. It's, it's as if Jesus says, don't you, don't you know I know what you're implying when you say that I'm going to kill myself? Don't you, know I, don't you know that I get that? Do you, I mean, do you understand that I get that? The source of your hostility and hatred and rejection, it's right out of the pit. You know, it's a terrifying thing to, to realize, but do you know that any person who rejects Jesus Christ and is still alive here on the face of this earth as a slave to Satan. You know that? You don't belong to yourself. No one belongs to themselves. You're either you either belong to Christ, you're 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 a, a servant of God, or you are a slave to the devil. There's no two, there's no in between. The world wants to tell you there's an in-between. There is no in-between. That's exactly what Ephesians 2 said. The person who is dead in sin walks according to the prince of the power of the air. Satan governs his life. So, so the first characteristic we see uh, to die in our sins is to be self-righteous and let Satan run your life. Because that's who's running your life. Satan loves self-righteous people. He does it. He loves self-righteousness. He loves it. And if you try to stand before God in your own righteousness, the guarantee is there. Jesus gives them the guarantee. He told these Pharisees and scribes that you will die in your sins. And that goes for any of us, too. Okay? Second way, uh, second characteristic for dying in your sins is verse 23, and it's in the middle. He said... You are from below, I am from above. And here's the key. You're of this world and I'm not of this world. Amen. So the second characteristic is to be worldly. It's to embrace the world system. To be completely sold out to the world. That's, that's why Christians are never called to be part or to be of the world. We're to be in the world, but not of the world. They, you know... People that are of the world live for the temporal, not the eternal. They never think of God in perspective and don't care about spiritual things. They just live for the temporal, for the immediate needs, the material things, the physical satisfaction that the world has to offer. Embracing the world system is a guarantee that you're going to die in your sins. Spend, spend an, an, an eternity unforgiven and unredeemed. Just be worldly and captive to the system and you can be guaranteed that's your future. John said it in best in 1 John 2. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You can't love this world in, in one hand and love it with all your heart and turn around in the other hand and say, I love God. You can't do it. It's impossible. Can't be done. There's a contrast there. Now, Notice what he said to them. He said, you're from below, I'm from above. You're of this world, I'm not of this world. In other words, you're completely immersed in the world system. You're bathed in it. You're, you're, you're immersed in that world system at this point. You love it. You're one and the same with it. James expressed it the best way, one of the best ways. He said it very clearly and succinctly. He drew the contrast to the most extreme way that it could be drawn in the fourth chapter, in the fourth verse, uh, where he said this. Listen to what he said. He said, you adulterous people. That's opening with a good word, huh? You adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend with the world makes himself an enemy of God. You want to be a friend of the world? You want to embrace what the world has to offer? You are an enemy of God. And I can guarantee you, if you're truly bought into the world system, 
if you're bought into this uh, materialism, all the isms, right? You know, if you're bought into all of that, I can guarantee you, you 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 need to you need to sit down and you need to start thinking real real good about what what you say is salvation, and and check that salvation. Now you can you can't be more exact than what he said there. And if you want to be diametrically opposed to God, just be in love with the system of this world because that dichotomy is there. Now, does it mean that we'll never fall? I'm seeing some looks. Does it mean that we'll never fall and kind of love some of the stuff the world has to offer? No, we do. We sin, we fall, we, 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 we do, we stumble. And, and we, and we maybe buy something we don't need or we do this or we, we get sucked in in advertising. Oh, it doesn't matter what it is, you know. Uh, sure, but we're forgiven for that, right? We have Jesus to lift us up. What do I mean by world system? What is this world system? Uh, what does the world promote? First, there's, there's three main things. When you think about what the world promotes, put them in the three main categories. The first would be humanism, right? Thinking, I'm good enough on my own. Secular humanism. Uh, man is absolute. Man is ultimate. I mean, how many times have you heard that? You know, I'm captain of my own ship. Who needs God? I can solve my own problems. I can run my own life. Look, I got what I got because of me. That's that's how. And so that's so that that first one is is like secular humanism. The second one is materialism. It's get all that I can and can all that I can get. Right. You know, I mean, I get it all and I keep it. I hang on to it, and if I don't have it, and you got it, I want it. That's materialism. I, whatever I can acquire. The third is sex, satisfaction. It's physical lust. That's what John said in 1 John 2.16, which says, For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, and the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not from the Father. It is from where? The world. The world is peddling these things and people are buying it. It's buying it. Someone's buying it because those are the only options that are, that are there in the world. When you try to shop in Satan's store, this is Satan's store. This world is his store. He only gives you a few choices. He puts them under big categories, but he gives you only a few choices because he's the proprietor and he knows what he wants to offer. And if you're completely and totally separated from God, you don't have any other choices. So the true believer is in a totally different realm. We're in a different realm. The one who rejects Christ is worldly and he's a slave to Satan and he's separated from God by an infinite gulf. But I want to—I want you to look at what a true believer is and look at the difference between a true believer and, and somebody that's lost. Look at John 15, 18, just for a sec. I'm just going to read it to you couple of verses here. He says in verse 18, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it, before it hated you. Now, I want you to think about this. Does the world hate you? Or do you get along with the world? I hope it hates you because it hates me, you know, and if we're following Jesus, it's going to hate you. Now watch this. He's talking to those believers, his disciples. He says, if you were of the world, which implies that they weren't, the world would love you as its own, but because you're not of the world, yes, you're part of the world, but you're not in it. You're you're there, but you're not part of the evil system because you're not of the world. Difference. But I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Isn't it great to know that God has chosen us out of this world? I mean, that's the difference. That's the difference. And I, I love what John says over in 1 John 5, 4. He says, for everyone who's been born of God, born of God, does what? Overcomes the world. Isn't that fantastic? Isn't it great to know that you're an overcomer? Uh, if you've received Jesus Christ and been born of God, you're not part of this world. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it? that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. We've overcome the world, and we're not of the world. Praise God. Amen. Look at me at Philippians 3. I put it down for you. 
And this passage so beautifully illustrates the contrast between the believer and the unbeliever in the terms of the world. Philippians 3.17 says, Brothers, join in imitating me, says Paul. This is Paul speaking, right? He says, And keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. In other words, he says, You have an example. Take note of how people live. Look around. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you that even with tears walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Many. The worldly person who doesn't know Jesus Christ is an enemy of Christ. And here's the description of the worldly person and what's going to happen. He says their end is destruction, their God is their belly, for they glory in their shame with minds set on earth earthly things. In other words, they flaunt their sinful activity. Does the world flaunt their sinful activity right in front of us all the time? What month is this? Can anybody tell me? It's Pride Month. Pride in what? Give me a break. Flaunt their sinful activity. It, it, isn't that so true today? People are proud of their evil deeds. But notice what it says in the last verse of verse 19. When it says, with their minds set on earthly things. Do you see that? It's their minds. They're set on the earthly things. But then all of a sudden, just like the sun is coming up, the sun is, is rising, uh... I think of Annie, you know, the sun will come up, right? You know, you come to verse 20. This is the is the world the world in verse 19. The world is has mind sits set on earthly things. But in verse 20, he says, But our citizen is, is citizenship is where? It's in heaven. And and from it we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. You see? The extreme contrast that Paul gives us here, the worldly person is preoccupied with the world and all the world has to offer. The God, their God, is their appetite. It's, it's, the, it's destruction is going to be, a, and their destruction is going to be a disaster. They, they flaunt their sin and they fix their minds on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. We're not of this world, praise God. Oh, we live here, but we're not of it. The world is going to pass away. And I'll tell you something. Everyone who's part of that world system is going to pass away with that world. Now, there's a surefire way to die in your sins. And yes, that's take these two uh, and, and embrace them. Let's not. Let's do the opposite, right? And, and that's, you know, that's what we just saw. We just saw, don't be self-righteous. And don't embrace this world. You need to you need to trust in Christ, and you need to to, uh, to to embrace the Lord Jesus Christ and what He has given us. So, um, you know, going after the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, that ain't gonna get you nowhere. You know, it's not gonna get you anywhere. Uh, next week we're gonna look at the last two. But let me say this as I close. Right? I talk to a lot of people about Jesus. And when I talk to people about Jesus, one of the things I, I try to gauge is where they are, what they understand it takes for people to go to heaven. I mean, I think most people think that they're going to heaven, which is odd, but they do. The world, is, the world has taught them that. They think that they're just good enough, or they just give enough, or they do enough, or they attend church enough, or they do a Bible study, or they give to the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, whatever it may be. I ask those questions and I hear those things and, and, and number one that comes back is works answers. It's like, I, I'm, I'm good enough, you know? And I'm telling you, the Bible says you're not good enough. And Jesus said, you'll die in your sins if, if, you, if you haven't embraced me and, and, and received me as your Savior and Lord. I'm gonna give you an opportunity to do that in just a second.